What's up, everyone, and welcome to the RRBG podcast. In this episode, I talk to John LaMacchia. You may know John from bands like Handeria or Spilacopa, but now he's got his solo project, his first debut album, Thunderheads, comes out May 20th. He's got features on the album from people like Kelly Scott of Failure, Mario Quintero of Spotlights, Michael from Candiria. They have a song out now called Bled Out, which you can watch the video on YouTube if you haven't heard it yet. It's fantastic. We talk about the writing for the album. We talked about Candiria. We spent a lot of time talking about a deadly accident that he was involved in a few years back and his experience with that. We talked about meditation. We talked about mental health. It was really great. I hope you guys enjoy it. Go pre-order the album from Aqualam Records on their Bandcamp page. Follow John at Lamakia Music on all the socials. Click down there on subscribe if you can for me, please, and hit the little bell so you get notifications. That way we can get cut through that algorithm. And if you can, check out our Patreon page. Go to patreon.com slash rrbg to support the podcast so I can keep doing this for free. Cheers. Real quick, let me do a little bit of business. Uh, shout out to Killcliff. Thank you for sending me these uh, Ignite energy drinks that uh, get me going when I can't make my morning coffee. <laughs> uh, this is more convenient to just pop open a can and they're you know they're they're healthier they're, they don't have a bunch of sugar and all that so i'm, I'm really? also yeah it's all sugar-free natural like ingredients and, and vitamins and whatnot so oh not bad actually yeah. one sec yeah yeah i'll keep promoting in the meantime so this is the 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 tequila kiwi uh the israel adesanya edition so. That's actually, I have the opposite. <laughs> Sugar free rebels. <laughs> you know, uh, every now and again, I have one of these. You know, when I need a little, when I need a little, mm, you know. Yeah, you know, I'm trying not to get. To, I'm trying to wean off of the caffeine because I hear that it's uh, one of the reasons why I get panic attacks. Oh, jeez. I mean, I'm sure there's other reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure there are other reasons I get anxiety, but I hear that caffeine's not good for it. And so I'm trying to wean off a little bit and trying to avoid consuming so much. I mean, I'm Cuban, dude. So ever since I was like four, my family's been feeding me coffee with milk and uh, all, all that nonsense. So yeah. it's a hard, it's a hard thing to, to get off of. But anyway, right, right. I mean, it's La Machia, right? Am I saying that La right? Yes. All right, cool. All right. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the RRBG podcast. I'm being joined today by John LaMacchia. How are mm -hmm. you, brother? I'm good, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being on. I mean, you are uh, a legend of sorts. As well, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, I find it uh, funny when, when um, me and the Candiria guys have a kind of running joke. When people when people say, like, use the word legendary. And, and I don't mean to, like, I, I'm so, like, it's great when people... But we have a we had kind of have a joke about like, um, you know, like we're like you know Bigfoot's legendary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's out yeah. there. He's out there somewhere. He hasn't showered in a while. Nobody understands him or loves him. <laughs> that sounds like me, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, it's 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 great to be you know it's great to be considered as such. But it's also like I, I always chuckle a little bit because um, me and these guys have a, a long running joke with that with that term. But thank you so much for having me on, and I appreciate the kind words. I really do. Yeah, no problem. You know, it's funny. I also have a weird association with the word. I try not to use it often because for me, I'm a wrestling fan, mm -hmm. and the WWE has made it a thing where if you're old, then you're a WWE legend. You're no right. longer a superstar. Right. So I, I try not to be I try not to use it because I don't want people to think I'm calling them old. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I'm grateful that in the music industry it is pretty much the same thing, but not nearly as you know what I mean. It's not it's not as black and white. Sure, um, sure. But uh, it's great to be considered that anyway, because I mean, damn, you know, we were just like you know, Candy Ray was just a bunch of guys, hardcore guys and like music fans that wanted to write all kinds of crazy music, you know, so yeah. To have any kind of notoriety in this industry is is definitely a thing to be happy and proud about. Absolutely, absolutely. So for those that are watching and listening and not aware, you know, you you were in Candiria, mm -hmm. uh, you were uh, Spilacopa mm -hmm. as well, and mm -hmm. now you got your solo project, your first solo project, right. which is just La Machia, right? La Machia. And uh, the album is called. Uh, I have it right there. Thunderheads. Thunderheads. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I heard the first track, man, and it's a beautiful song. A little bit of a departure for fans of Candaria that haven't heard mm-hmm. it. I don't think it's that much of a departure from Spilacopa. Like this, you know, Spilacopa is a lot more experimental and it goes up and down. But there are some Spilacopa songs that kind of have that vibe. But uh, I, I likened it more to like uh, like Failure, which mm-hmm. you have Kelly Scott is on it, so. Sure, yeah. um, you know, it has that failure vibe, a little bit of Radiohead vibe, you know, uh-huh. that, that kind of. So uh, what got you to, to kind of lean into that direction as opposed to something heavier or hardcore that, you know, you're, you're known from? Um, well, I've, um, I've always really written songs, you know, throughout my, my, my whole life. You know, Candiria, my, my, time, my, my time with Candiria was really purely because I just loved the, how original and different the band was, um, you know, before, prior to playing in Candiria, I was, I was, I guess I could say I was a fan. I mean, you know, we, we definitely, you know, they were like hometown heroes, even though for the short amount of time they existed before I, I joined the band in that short time, in that short time period of like 95 to 97, they made, really like made an impact on all the musicians in, in that, in, in, in Brooklyn and New York city. Uh, so when I joined the band, it really was where I was coming from. The kind of music I was playing was definitely more closer to what uh, is on this record. And what is really the, the heart and soul of kind of what I do is really just writing like it's songwriting. You know, that's really basically it. Um, it's metallic, but it's, you know, it's doomy and dreary and maybe like, you know, even more like on the alternative side, but that's really, truly where I kind of, that's where my soul is. That's always been where my soul is. All right. All right. That's good to hear. Uh, I mean, so it, it's odd. Then, then, then the question is what took so long for you to start doing something solo like this? Um, I guess, you know, to be honest with you, uh, this was just going to be another Spila Copa record. That's, that's really mm. what, this is a, really how it started out. Um, and, you know, if you didn't know this, Spilacopa has been really just me for the past, I'd say, um, for a very long time, it's been just me. Even though the full length that came out some years ago, uh, Parallels, had Julie Christmas and uh, Jeff Kashid of Isis on it. Those songs were recorded in 2007, and uh, 2006 or something like that. And it was just released later on simply because um, a, a, different, a, a series of circumstances just you know, happened throughout the years and um, it just happened that way. But um, that said, this was going to be just another Spila Copa record. And it was um, uh, a friend of mine who suggested that I kind of rebrand and sort of, you know, think about using, cutting through the noise of like Spila Copa Candiria, what is this, you know, and just starting fresh and doing something new. Um, And I do feel that um, although it is, you know, still me writing the music and, and it's coming through me. It's a definitely a singular vision. Um, I do feel that there's a change in, in, in the attitude and sort of the, uh, the production value, I think is definitely better than anything I've ever done before. Um, but uh, what took me so long as far as the name goes, I guess I just was never, I was never, not that I didn't, didn't like my name or anything, but I just, I guess I was never, Um, confident enough to sort of use my name and just claim something as my own. Um, Mm -hmm. But I am now and I'm I'm really, really happy in this position that I'm in. And I'm extremely grateful to all the people that are supporting me, like my bandmates, uh, the record label, my manager, Chris Enriquez, um, who has been unbelievable and and just incredible. Um, Chris is the homie, man. (laughs) Chris, he's great. He's great. He's been great. but I really am grateful for all the support I'm getting and all of the faith um, that people, are, you know, they're like putting their faith in me because they believe in me. And it's really something to be appreciative and grateful for. But it also gives me the confidence to sort of lead. And um, it's really like a long time coming, but I'm, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah, I, I was just in New York, actually, a couple weeks ago or a week and a half ago and uh, went out there to do a a podcast with uh the stoke the fire guys and oh yeah Ooh, and uh, C- chris chris went, was out there and he ended up you know after the show he was like come with me i'm gonna show you some spots right and, right yeah, it was a fun time he took me to a couple like you know iconic locations like the american graffiti building and uh-huh. um niagara and he ended up buying me a shot of whiskey at the niagara and i ended up walking right outside the door and puking it out because i hadn't eaten dinner Oh God! 
<laughs> it just, and it wasn't like I was wasted or anything. It was just, it was like the second sure. I took it, I felt it mm. burning inside. Mm. And I'm like, oh, I haven't eaten. And then mm-hmm. I was and just, bah. And he was like, that's the most punk rock thing I've ever seen. I'm like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> the perfect place to do it. You're at Niagara, man. That's it. Yeah, um, yeah. That's, that's great, man. Uh, yeah, that's 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 hysterical. I was I was really hoping to make that, but I wasn't able to do it. I, I think I was away. I was away, and I just couldn't I couldn't get back in time. Um, yeah, no, I mean um, Jesse is another. I mean, he's incredible, man. And I actually sent him the record, and he he had some really wonderful things to say about it because he's been his, he's been a supporter of Candiria for many many years, and um, yeah. he was one of the people that I had in mind. Like we sent the record around to some like you know key people. We wanted to get input and we wanted to get some feedback and he had some really, really wonderful things to say and encouraging things to say. So um, I, I really do appreciate that dude so much. That's awesome, man. That, mm-hmm. I mean, I you know, maybe for the second, the follow up, he'll he'll show up and do a, a, a guest spot. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, is that the plan now moving forward? Do you want to do more of these, you know, La Machia records? I mean, this is it really. I, I, I you know, me and Mike always say it. We've said it throughout the years. Never say never with Candiria because something is always brewing. Um, we have so much history that, you know, Candiria just really could just continue to put out the older records in different formats. Like most of the albums have not been released on vinyl yet. So I'm definitely, I'm always working on something with Candiria. It's just whether or not the band is actually a functioning unit. Um, and right now it seems pretty impossible for us to do anything. We get asked to do stuff all the time, but um, you know, the drummer, the last drummer we had, Dan, he has two kids. He has a full-time job. Uh, Julio, my guitar player, he just had a, he had a kid. Um, it's just crazy. It's like there's babies everywhere. You know, yeah. Carly's working full-time. He's doing his own thing. And so for now, I mean, this is it. You know, Lamaki is going to be my thing. And I just, I'm, I'm so happy doing this. Um, I'm so happy with the band that I have right now. I have, um, um, just a great group of players that are so um, psyched to play the music and uh, they're just down, they're dedicated, they're showing up. Um, it's, it amazes me. People show up, I'm like, yo, we're gonna rehearse Sunday and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I can't even believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm, just, I'm just pumped. I guess, you know, like the whole pandemic thing really like really put things in perspective of, of just how hard it is to do this when, you know, things are the way they are in the world now um money is you know everything is getting harder and harder just to get by um you know people lost so much work i mean you know and we have so much making up to do but for some reason i guess another thing that you know got put into perspective is how important it is to do what you love to do and um it shows because um these musicians that i play with show up and they're so down to do this and um i can't i couldn't be happier Hell yeah. yeah. And I know you said Chris is doing drums, I believe. Enriquez was for a moment. Um, okay, now okay. it's um, this guy, Jeff Genstrom. He plays in a band called Savak and he plays in another band called The Twin. And okay. he is a fantastic player and he's just a sweetheart of a guy. And uh, he comes to the rehearsals and he brings like sweets and cookies and stuff. And it's like, <laughs> man, how much can you can't ask for much more than that? Um, <laughs> He's a, he's a great guy. And, and like I said, he's a hell of a player. So we're really, really lucky to have him. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, because Chris just launched his solo project. So I was like, yep. this is a, you know, he's going to be a busy boy. But I guess that, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It's a very incestuous scene. You know, it really is. Um, I recorded the, I recorded most of Chris's albums, album for him. And I, yeah. I shot his first and directed his first video for him. Um, so it is, it's a very incestuous sort of scene where everybody's kind of like, you know, I don't know. Everybody's involved in some way. Um, and he was actually the person that suggested Jeff uh, come and check, try out for the band. And it was an easy, like the minute he walked in the room and played one song, I was like, well, you got the job, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it was really easy to, to make that make that happen. Yeah, it's interesting that that northeast um, area is very, like you said, incestuous like that. It's I don't like mm-hmm. that word, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, like, you know, you look at bands like Cave In and Converge and all that. Like oh, They yeah. all work together and oh, everybody's it. all. Yeah. It might as well just be one band where they play just like all of the Converge. They can play like Cave In songs, Old Man Gloom songs, Converge songs, just like one big thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it is it is great to have like your own. 
um, sort of ecosystem now, you know, that you have like a community of musicians and people that sort of are just sort of pushing your own, Jesus, your own sort of culture. Um, you know what I mean? I think that's like a, a big thing right now that um, can really be helpful as far as like building your brand and uh, sort of helping um, build like your audience, so to speak. You know? Sure. Yeah. It's something that's super important and uh, something that I feel is kind of lacking in, in Los Angeles because I'm out here mm. and maybe I'm maybe it's just because I'm a little disconnected from the actual creative scene because I, mm. you know, I, I, I'm not doing it anymore, but it just feels a little more disconnected, a little more cutthroat out here. Like people aren't really working together as opposed to mm. over there where you're building this massive community. Right. And I think that that's super important. Yeah, it definitely is really, really um, it's a it's a healthy scene here, man. It really is. Um, and uh, even though it branches off into different styles and sounds and whatnot, we still all kind of like stay connected. We still all support each other. And um, yeah, we really I mean, I guess it's like you really have to count your blessings when, when you do have a situation like that. And um, when you don't um, and you realize that it's an important thing that's missing in your community, then it's maybe, you know, it's a thing to consider to kind of work on to take steps to help build one um so i hope uh, something does start to happen there for you guys on the west coast you know it's so it's so odd to me specifically i'm, I'm i was born in jersey i'm from that area and mm -hmm. you know the reputation used to be that uh new yorkers new jersey there we have attitudes you know right, there's, right, a, right. there's an edge uh, everybody's angry. Everybody's flipping each other off. Mm -hmm. And the West West Coast is more. Uh, everybody's high. Everybody's like, oh, this is cool vibes, bro. <laughs> but it's the opposite. It's really yeah. the opposite. Everybody that's out here trying to make a living, they just want to step on you on the way up. And, mm -hmm. and we're, whereas in New York, everybody's more of a family, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. I wonder what that is. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I can't. Who knows why? But. Yeah. Um, I definitely, uh, I love both. I love both LA and New York, but I don't think I could live in LA. I don't know why I'm bringing that up, but but I guess the reason why I'm bringing it up is because it's part of it. It's part of the reasons why reason why I love New York City so much. There's, it's a really crazy, crazy place to live. It's really not for everyone, but yeah. if you are here and you do make this your home, it can be like a small town. It really can be like a small town. It can can have a small town vibe. And I think that's the thing that um, I still, I'm, I'm still in love with. I'm still in love with the idea that I have this sort of family, this community of people that um, when I go out to a show or when I play a show, they show up. Or whenever I go to a show and I'm supporting someone else, I know a lot of people there, you know? So there's that part of it that just, um, I think, uh, just I couldn't live without that. Yeah, no, I hear you, man. Oh. I, I, that, and I felt it immediately when I got there for the the show, the podcast, I, the Stoke the Fire. You know, mm -hmm. when I walked into that building and I saw Chris and I saw Jesse, and I was just like, oh, I'm. It felt it felt like home. It wasn't like a, right. a weird out of town vibe. You know, it just felt mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm here now. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to bring something up that perhaps you, if you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to. I just wanted to bring it up because I've experienced something very similar. Uh, but I was watching a documentary on, on Candiria and you talk about an accident that you guys had. Right. And I, I myself had a very devastating, you know, uh, where I was proclaimed dead. Wow. Uh, that, that kind of, you know, head on collision, 60 miles an hour. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. So. And uh, I experienced some really wild things uh, internally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that just to see, you know, I know you've mentioned it before. You don't have to, you know, break down the actual accident, but more, more, I'm more interested in the after effects. Um, mm. You know, when, when, were there, was there a moment where you were unconscious? And if so, like, did you see anything? Did you experience anything? Because, you know, you hear the light at the end of the tunnel thing. I didn't see that. Mm. But did you see anything? Well, it's funny you mentioned that because I was one that was. You know, when we got hit, I was immediately, I lost consciousness immediately. And I don't remember, I'm one of the fortunate ones that didn't actually experience the um, accident to the fullest extent. Um, I was laying down um, with my head toward the back of the van. Thankfully, we had a trailer. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't even be here. Um, but when we were hit, 
I immediately lost consciousness because I, I must have hit my head immediately. Um, and then we we jackknifed and flipped and went back into the tr tr uh, semi truck and got hit again. And we started flipping. And I was thankfully unconscious for all of that, whereas the rest of the guys in the band and the and our tour manager were not. Um, but I I have one snapshot in my head where I'm like against the ceiling of the van and I, I'm just like, you know, I'm just planted there and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the van from that perspective. And then um, I don't remember anything. And then I wake up on the highway and I swear to God, it was like I was born. I was like born again. It was like the light was so bright and it was so, I was so, it was very peaceful. I didn't feel, I wasn't in any pain. Everything was very uh, warm. Um, and there was a man who was trying to help me. He was putting a, a jacket, like, I don't remember this, but I was told he put a jacket under my head and he was talking to me and he was trying to just comfort me. Um, but all I remember is that light, that bright, bright light, like a yellow light, like, like seeing, seeing a sun, seeing a sunset or seeing like the sun in your eyes, but it didn't burn your eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what I remember seeing. And I could definitely see why people mention a light at the end of a tunnel or some kind of light that they see. Um, because after that, I wound up, I, I blacked out. And, and then last, the next time I was up, um, the doctors were waking me up, like smacking mm -hmm. me in the face and, and getting me up because they had to do, like they had to give me a catheter and they also had to put a tube up my nose and down my throat. Um, that was and, at the hospital or, or yeah, that was at the hospital. Mm. You have to be conscious for that because you have yeah. to help them like, you, you know, um, but yeah, it was, uh, that's, it, that's definitely something that I saw. Um, and that I, that is definitely notable. I'll never forget that. Um, but, um, so, I mean, when did this happen to you? How long ago was this? Um, 2002. Wow. Same, had... same. Wow. Okay. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 2002. I was like, it was just on my way to work and my buddy wanted to borrow my car. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause uh, he wanted to take a girl out on a date who was in the car. Um, and I, my, so uh, I let him drive. It was him and his girl in the front seat. And I was in the back. And I was like, just drop me off at work, take my car, take her on a date. It's cool. And then uh, we had our accident and my seat ripped off. The back seat oh, completely ripped off, and I smashed into his girl. Oh my she, god! Yeah, she broke her thigh bone, like the I don't know what the actual science term of that bone is, but the thigh oh. bone, uh, and a bunch of other vertebrae and stuff too. And then I hit her, and then I bounced back out and smashed against the back window. Wow. And uh, uh, I so I when I woke up, I woke up a couple times during the accident, like I. I I remember seeing the car coming at us, mm -hmm. passing out, then opening my eyes and we were spinning and then I passed mm -hmm. out again. And then I woke up to trying to get out of the car, but I couldn't because mm -hmm. my collarbone had broken and was stabbing me in the, the jaw. Oh so I couldn't, I couldn't turn my head. I was like trying to turn my head. And uh, I, I remember looking out the window and seeing a, a dude running at the car and ripping the door out like a superhero. Like, wow. That's like, that's like, I think that's where superheroes come from. Mm -hmm. Somebody had some kind of similar experience. They saw that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then I woke up in the helicopter to paddles. The, oh, you my know. God. <laughs> Jesus. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, what I, the reason I asked is because I saw, uh, I saw some like geometric shapes, which wow. kind of like, um, I had no explanation for. Mm -hmm. And then it's dedicated the following like two to three years to figuring that out. Like, I'm like, what was that? And, wow. um, I found out what it was and it's, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, you want to elaborate? Was, um, you know, it, it, I ended up tattooing it on my arm. That was like the first tattoo I ever got was that wow. circle, that circle right there. Wow. Uh, and I discovered that it's uh, old Egyptian geometry called sacred geometry. It was the seed okay. of life. Wow. And that's why I put a, I put the seed and then I grew a tree out of it just to be, I don't know, a hippie, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it kind of, you know, when you read about the sacred geometry thing, it explains that that's how creation was, you know, it's just all math and uh -huh. numbers and it starts off as a dot, then it's two dots, then it kind of just circles out from there. Wow. And, and, you know, it was interesting to me and, and, um, 
you know, I never went into the religious route with it because a lot of people, right. when they have similar experiences, they, they, oh, Jesus saved me or God oh. saved me. Like, I didn't, I didn't ever see a person or anything like that. I never really went the faith route. I went more right. into the science route. Like, what was that? <laughs> right, right, right. Well, Eddie, I have to tell you, man, uh, me and you have a lot of similarities in this because I, too, uh, got this tattooed years mm. later. It's the accident. It's really the accident date. People think it's something else. It's Satan, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, I knew that that was going to happen. And I, I love the idea of that, too. But it was. It happened September 9th, and, and it happened at 9 a.m. So the ninth month, ninth day of the month, and the ninth hour of that day. That's when the accident happened. So um, several years later, whenever, I forget when, when exactly I decided to do it. It was some years after the accident. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to get this because it was just such a crazy experience that changed the course of my life changed the course of like candiria's life and um it's interesting man because what happened to me was i had these crazy experiences um after the accident i was having these dizzy spells um mm -hmm. because i suffered from like a, a bruised brain that yeah. was part of one of the in injuries global hematoma or something like that i think it was called global something like that anyways like a, my brain was bruised and um I was having these dizzy spells and they lasted to, for, I mean, they lasted up until a few years ago. I, I haven't had a dizzy spell. I haven't woken up with a dizzy spell in the last few years, but up until recently I was, I would have them occasionally when after the accident, I was having them all the time. They were so bad that I couldn't, if I, if I leaned up and had a dizzy spell, it was like, I had to hold on to something because it was just like the whole world was just going like this. It was nuts. Um, but what another thing that I wound up happening, what that wound up happening to me was I was having these, um, these not visions, they weren't visions. They were like dreams when I was, but I wasn't fully asleep. They were like these, like, um, I don't know what you could, what you would call it, but I think it had something to do with the traumatic experience. Um, well, actually, I found out what it had to do with it. I'll give you an example of what, what, what happened. Like, I had this one um, sort of waking dream where I was laying in bed, and beyond my door that was locked, um, I lived in a railroad apartment, so I had my own entrance. Beyond the door was, uh, so there was knocking at the door, some knocking, and um, I just ignored it at first. And then the knocking got harder and harder and harder, and, the, like, the more... I heard the knocking, the more I imagined what was on the other side. And it was like this gruesome fucking female figure that was just trying to get in and like would not stop. And it was either going to, I was going to just sit there and listen to this pounding on this door forever. I was going to open it. Um, but that was this vision I had. And I was kind of like, I had like, it was so crazy that I had this, like, it was almost like a night terror, but I was like frozen and it was like my own thoughts doing it. Um, and it got so bad that I was, I actually, um, I went to see a therapist about it. I had to go see a therapist about it. And um, they explained something to me. And it was this wild shit, man. Because what wound up happening was, I didn't realize this. And, and um, it was so fucked up when she said this, because I was like, that's it. Um, I went to see, at, shortly after the accident happened, two weeks later, the girl I was with at the time wanted to go see the movie The Ring. Okay. Mm. Which was... When I went to fucking sit, like we sat down and the movie started and I'm usually good with horror movies, but the minute the first horror scene happened, I was like shook by it. And I was like, wait, maybe I should fucking not watch this. Maybe this isn't a good time. And I watched the whole movie and I didn't think anything about it. Um, and it, these things started happening to me where I would see these really horrific things. And then I went to see a therapist and I went to see someone, you know, through the insurance, you know, with them knowing about what happened to me. And um, I was explaining, I was like, I'm seeing these things, I'm seeing these horrible visions, and it's like, it's so fucking terror, it's terrifying me, you know? And she said, well, you know, you were in this accident, and you experienced this intense physical trauma, but you remember nothing of the actual accident itself. She goes, obviously, your brain is trying to sort of find some horrific things this this thing that you can look at and relate it to this like physical pain that you're, you're experiencing and you that you did experience and as soon as she said it i was like that's it that's exactly what this is my fucking mind just there's nothing to 
to like, there's no memory of like, why does my fucking, why is my arm broken? Why is my rib, my collarbone, my scapula, all this was broken, but I had nothing to connect it to. And it, my, my brain was trying to make sense of shit, I guess. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, it did, it got better after that because I, I knew it, I knew it was happening. And um, I just, uh, it's crazy how science works. It's crazy how the mind works. It's crazy how, um, how incredible it is to have a team of doctors and they can just kind of help you manage all aspects of something like that, you know? So yeah. wild stuff, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I, I, they held me in at the hospital for a bit after, uh, cause they also found, they, they found something in my brain on the scans. They saw like a, you know, like a, like a black area. Whoa. And, and they were like, well, we got to have to keep you here for observation. But then it went away. Wow. And I'm like, but I'm just like, that's weird. That was, Fucking that, crazy. That's a little weird. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it, the, that makes sense to me too. You know, that your brain's trying to find some way to connect it to, to anything. And maybe that wow. is the case with me too, with, you know, what I saw and what kind of connections I made afterwards with, you know, the sacred geometry and trying to figure out, you know, the creation of life and what's the meaning mm -hmm. of it all and why am I still here and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Did you find that um, after, you know, maybe years later uh, that you discovered something, like, did you start doing something new? Did you start doing art? Because I started doing music after the accident. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah interesting. Um, you know, no, I, I, it didn't affect me in that way, but I, what I do remember is that I started, um, I started to, to sort of think that this was sort of my, my life. This is it. This is my story is accidents because this isn't the first accident I've been in. I've been in several throughout the years. And there was like a, a, a like, there was like this, this numbers thing that was happening. So my first time that I ever broke a bone or had any kind of like accident was when I was five years old and my sister Gina took me on like a joyride on a bicycle and we were kids and uh, she's swerving and my, my leg gets caught in the spokes and the bike stops and she's just pounding on the pedal and breaks my leg. Okay. So I'm, I'm five. I don't even remember. It didn't feel, I didn't feel anything. I was so young whatever, you know, I broke my leg. That's the first time. Then 10 years later, I'm 15 years old. I'm on a skateboard, um, skating through an avenue. It's raining. And this woman beats close to a red light and hits me. And it's my first real accident. I, I'm unconscious. I spent 10 days in the hospital. I had surgeries on my leg. Um, you know, there's another one. It's 10 years. Then eight years later, I was in a, a head on collision like yourself on Christmas day. Um, Oof, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I was on Christmas. It was on Christmas, and I was in a head-on collision. I broke my femur bone. It was probably the most painful thing I've ever experienced. And when you mentioned somebody coming over and ripping over open off the car door, I had the fire department had to come and do something similar. Um, and then they pulled me out, and it was probably the most painful experience of my life. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I was screaming so like loud. It was just like, I wasn't even trying to scream. It was just like this thing was just happening because of the amount of pain. And I was just kept, you know, like passing out. But then six years later, that's when the, wait, is it six years later? Six, yeah, six years later, 2002, that's when the Candiria accident happened. So I'm like, this is, is this the way I'm going to die? Is the next accident going to be four years and then two years, then one year, and then, then I die? So I started like thinking this and it was like this, fucking idea in my head that I couldn't get out of my head. Um, and then I don't know how many years later, well, whatever, the, the four years passed, nothing happened. You know, the six years passed, nothing happened, but I still always kept that in my mind. And then um, someone who I'm very, very close to said to me, you know, just because you have this, these, this, this history, you know, don't make that your life. It doesn't define you just because don't make these it your future. things. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to, don't make it your story. Don't make it your story because that's just an unhealthy way to live your life. It's negative and it's an un unhealthy way to think about things. So after that conversation and, and realizing like, man, this is such a fucking shitty thing to do to myself. Yeah. Haven't I been through enough? And now here I am. I'm like just waiting for this horrible thing to happen to me. 
So I kind of let go of that. And um, although that doesn't mean that my chances of something happening hasn't changed, but at least I don't, don't, I don't like, you know, I'm not sort of, I'm not torturing myself in the meantime, you know, with these thoughts. Um, yeah. So uh, that's something I started doing that was very unhealthy after the accident. Um, but uh, I don't do that any longer. That's good, man. Yeah, because yeah. there's also, I mean, I, I, one of the things that I learned or discovered after was that uh, ability to make things happen. Like you manifest, I know that sounds cheesy, the secret mm -hmm. and uh, manifest destiny and all that stuff, but it's sure. true. It's definitely mm -hmm. true. If you put yourself, if you put your mind to something, Mm -hmm. uh, you'll make it happen. And it sure, goes yeah. both, it goes both ways. You know, if it's yeah. positive, like I'm going to make this album, you'll mm -hmm. make it, you'll make the album. Sure. Um, yeah. But also if you, your brain is like, I'm going to die in four years, right. something you might manifest something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. It's definitely better to not do that because <laughs> yeah. you may just manifest it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And the numerology thing too, like I know you said you got the nine nine nine, and mm -hmm. uh, you know there was like a number of time that you know mm -hmm. did you did you get obsessed with like numerology and reading on like the significance of numbers? Did you start um, seeing eleven eleven everywhere? <laughs> uh, well, I've always been fascinated with the number nine, uh, regardless of when this accident happened. But this accident, I guess, just made it more like you know, it's just a, a number that I, I feel is. Um, it's just such an organic number, the way that like, no matter what, how many times you multiply it, no matter what you do, you turn it, you can turn it into just nine, you go back to that number. Um, it's pr pretty amazing in that regard. Um, so just as, as like the way it behaves in, in the universe and in nature, it's just like a beautiful thing to me. Um, other than that, like um, I do love math. I love numerology. I love all things um, to do. Not that I'm some kind of mathematician or anything like that. But when I, when I think about music, I love math and music. I love the idea of math and nature and in, and in the universe and in the world. Um, I think it's a fascinating, um, incredibly powerful thing that, that exists all around us. Um, and uh, I definitely do pay attention to numbers when they come up. I do. I'm, I'm definitely the type of person that um, I'm sensitive to it, I would say, like yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I love about a, a progressive metal or, you know, bands like Dillinger or anything that that plays with time signatures. I, mm -hmm. I really, the, I'm really attracted to that type of music just because uh, I sit there and I'm like counting in my head and then sure. I start looking at, and when they switch it up on me, I'm, I start laughing. Like, that's my mm -hmm. reaction. It's just like, ah, yeah. look at what they did. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it's weird that that's, you know, and, and like I said, for me, you know, I discovered that I should make music after mm -hmm. the accident. Um, so there's always, there's this weird esoteric kind of spiritual thing that I connect music and numbers and all of that to. So uh, for you, is there, do you dive into that at all in terms of uh, discovering, like, you know, we, you said, I said that there's no religious aspect to what I do, but do you find yourself you know, reading anything like Buddhism or reincarnation or any of that kind of stuff. Is that, did any of that trigger after your experience? You know, um, not particularly. I'm not a, um, I don't, I've never had any type of spiritual, um, I'm a spiritual person. I do believe in, I believe in the possibility of, of, uh, a greater, you know, a greater, of course, a greater force that, you know, somehow, some way we were created by some force. Some, well, some something's thing. keeping you here after so many accidents. Uh, of course, too, <laughs> that, that as well. There is there. I believe in that. I, I just don't specifically um, subscribe to any particular religion. However, yeah. as of late, as of late, I have been participating in a monthly or semi-monthly ritual, like a circle. I won't get too deep into it because it's not really, I'm just a participant. I just show up and I get to, um, I get to enjoy the, um, the sort of the benefits, which are, you know, we meditate on, on the universe. We meditate on, on, on the aspects of nature and, and obviously numerology has a lot to do with that. Um, and it's the closest thing I've ever had to any kind of religion, it really is. And I'm, I'm really grateful that I'm included. It's a very small circle of, of people that do it. 
And um, I'm, I'm, I, every one of them, I want to I want to be at every single one of them when they happen. I can't always I can't get to every one of them because of my schedule. But um, when I am with these with these folks that that do this thing, and I'm not going to go into details about it. Sure. Um, yeah. But uh, it is really it's really gratifying. It's really it's really something that I hold um, like it's really important to me. Um, and it's funny that it's happening now in, in my life after all of these years, but it, it makes perfect sense. Like this is this idea of, of religion or, or spirituality makes more sense to me than anything I've ever experienced. You know, um, I was raised uh, Roman Catholic and I am so far removed from, from that, like that idea. And that's not to say that I don't prescribe to some of the teachings, some of the, um, you know, but, be nice and uh, you know yeah, don't don't kill course. people and <laughs> right but as an organization as a um as an entity the roman catholic church is not something i um really can get down with any longer um and i don't know how people really can and it's their thing not mine i i but you know i don't want to judge but what i know i is enough for me to know that it's not for me that's really yeah. all i can say yeah, I'm the same way, man. I mean, Jersey, I was in a private school. I was in St. Anne's and a couple, you know, they just, that was the, the my upbringing was Catholic. And then uh, as I got older, I was like, what, 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 what are you guys doing? Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think meditation is one of the most important things and people give it this weird stigma of like, oh, it's religious or it's spiritual oh. or it's, you know, hippie, dippy, whatever. It's like... Oh, yeah. You don't have to connect it to that. I mean, the the way I try to explain it to most people, the uh, meditation is really the only time your brain gets to, to rest uh -huh. because, you know, when you go to bed at night, your must like imagine working out at the gym, doing bicep curls uh -huh. for your whole life right. and then it, without resting, <laughs> your, right. your sure, arm yeah. would cramp up and right. atrophy and you couldn't use your arm. So that's mm. what your brain's doing because when you go yeah. to bed your body rests but your brain is going you're dreaming uh -huh. you're you know you're thinking of things sure. and the only moment it gets to stop rest and heal and grow as a muscle if you want to call it that um mm -hmm. is when you're meditating is when you're getting right. at that moment of peace right. so i think it's really really important and it should be part of everyday life like brushing your teeth and going to bed it should uh -huh. be yeah, if you can get it in, if you can do it, and you have the time and you have the spare time, even 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 a five to ten minute meditation is like a really really it's a really really healthy healthy thing to incorporate in your life. Um, it's not easy to shut your brain down or quiet your brain down. Not shut you're not shutting anything down, but yeah, to, yeah. it's not easy to quiet your brain. But if you can if you can practice it and you can and you can get used to it and you can get into a rhythm and you can sort of get comfortable with it. It is really, really help. It's really healthy. It's really helpful too. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. to kind of lean it, you know, steer it back into music. Do you find that sure. now that you're doing this meditation, has it helped with your writing, your creativity, like the sparking of, of new music? Um, yeah, actually, because um, we actually do incorporate music here and there um, in this, and it uh, it's taken me into the directions that I've explored in the past, but that I haven't. Um, uh, uh, sort of um, meddled with, so to speak, um, until recently. And um, it's great to use music as a sort of supplement and not use it as, as like, oh, this is the thing. This is the thing you're here for. It's yeah. supplemental in, in a situation like that because the more important thing is the ritual itself or the meditation itself. And the, the music is just a supporting role, plays a supporting role. Um, so in that way, it definitely has, most certainly has. That's cool. Yeah. Um, now with the new, the, the solo album, you know, the song that's out now has a particular vibe. Is that vibe kind of what we, what we can expect from the rest of the album or do you kind of, cause you're, you know, you, you listen to Candaria, it's very experimental. Mm -hmm. You know, there there's songs that range from death metal to hip hop to jazz to whatever. So do yeah. you kind of take that approach to. Uh, with this new album, or is it kind of like the same consistent vibe with with that single that's out? Well, that's actually one of the things that I wanted to kind of take with me from Candiria was this diversity, you know. Um, and although the spectrum of of sound is is a little 
it's a little sl like if Candiria is like this and it's the whole gamut from jazz to ambient music um what i'm doing with lamakia is it's a little bit more um it's it's a little less broad but it ranges from like uh, um, electronic music in the vein of like Radiohead or like Massive Attack. And then there's some like more mellow acoustic dark rock stuff like Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Um, then there's like some uh, stuff like more like Failure or Autolux. You know, there's it, there's a range. It's like rock music, some acoustic stuff and some uh, like like um, deep like electronic heavy kind of stuff like Massive Attack or Lorne. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I do. I did want the experience to be similar to a Candiria album. Like when, when someone listens to a Candiria album, they hear this. It's, it's more like an experience or journey and not just like, this is the next song. This is the next song. It's like this, this movement, you know? Um, and I, you know, it works for me. And uh, so far the feedback I've been getting from it, people are kind of into, into it and they feel like there's a, there's a consistency to it. Even though the sounds may change, there's something about it that seems to work. Um, and, um, I hope the experience for people that hear it feel the same way, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I mean, I hope I'm, I'm stoked to hear the rest of the album. I have to pre-order the vinyl cause I'm, I'm a vinyl collector now, apparently. Oh, awesome, man. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it seems like you're, you're going on or you're playing a show with Shiner and Spotlights. Are you getting ready for a tour of, uh, in anytime soon? Uh, we, we did play that show with uh, Spotlights and Shiner. That was the first gig we played. This Sunday, we're playing um, at Union Pool in Brooklyn uh, with oh, Ben. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love the place. A yeah. band called Frail. Um, it's actually all of the band. Uh, all the bands that are performing are, are Aqualam Records, and Aqualam has been a great. They're such a great label. They're, they're such great people. I've never been. I've never worked so closely with a label before. It's like I, I can't even believe how hard these guys work. It's incredible. Um, so uh, it's an it's sort of like an Aqualam presents event, uh, event on Easter Sunday, um, and it's Frail, uh, my band La Machia, uh, a band called Burning Tongue, and another uh, artist named Zeb Gould, who is a fantastic solo artist. He's really incredibly talented. Um, so are all the other bands, but him in particular, I am. It's more like in my wheelhouse, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking forward to seeing his show and seeing the rest of the bands, of course. Um, but it's going to be a great night. We're doing like an Easter egg hunt with like lots of really cool prizes. Um, uh, my buddy Chris Santos, uh, who's a chef, celebrity chef, he was kind enough to uh, donate um, through uh, the Tau, Tau, Tau Hospitality to donate um, a $150 gift certificate to any Tau restaurant, including Beauty in Essex or Lavo, New York City or right. um, any Tao restaurant. Like we have all kinds of stuff like that. Another restaurant called Mena uh, did another gift certificate. We have like so many cool sponsors for the show. Um, so if you come out, you know, there's going to be an egg hunt. And uh, well, this may come out after Sunday. It probably will come out after it Sunday. It might come out after Sunday. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you missed the show. You missed the egg hunt. It was a great show, hunt. it was so good. <laughs> we had a great time. <laughs> I won all the prizes. <laughs> um so is i mean uh, are you planning a tour and if you are like what would be your ideal package for a, a tour like that well we are planning a tour and it's actually going to be in august it's not it's not really a tour this one thing that we're planning right now in august in early august is really just like a, an extended weekend and it'll be um it'll be la Machia and light tower uh okay. chris Enrique's band and then I think for each city we perform in, we're going to have a different band to play with. So we're going to do a date. Right now we have locked in. We have um, August 5th in Long Island. I believe it's Amityville Music Hall. And then um, we're going to be in Philly on the snow. We're going to be in, oh God. The only thing we have locked down so far is Long Island on August 5th and in Philly at Ortlieb's on August, on August 7th. And we're not sure who the rest of the bands are going to be on the bill yet. But we're also going to be in Brooklyn on the 4th. And in the 6th, we're supposed to go down to Baltimore. So that's the plan. Um, and then after that, we're going to be, I mean, there's going to be stuff happening in June and, and July. But that's like one thing that's being planned. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to ask you, I kind of like skipped over it with my notes. But, you know, um, a while back when Spilacopa first debuted, 
Um, you had Greg from Dillinger on as kind right. of like a main main vocalist. You know, even sure. there was other guest vocalists in the album as well. Right. But um, what what kind of you know? I never look into those type of things. I don't. I'm not the type to just read about what happens with band members or dive too deep into it. Sure. So what what happened to to that situation? To like the follow up album didn't have Greg. Like was that always right. the plan, or did you want to have Greg and then it's something didn't work out? Well, no, it, it actually actually was totally the plan. The first, the original plan, the way I remember it, and and you know, if you ask Greg, he might remember it differently, because this was quite some this was quite some time ago. Yeah. But um, you know, we wrote uh, a bunch of songs and recorded a bunch of songs, and that were never fully mixed. But we did mix the first initial EP that did come out. The initial Spilocopa EP came out. Um, and then our plan was six months later, directly after that release, we were going to put in the second one out. But uh, Greg started getting really busy with Dillinger Escape Plan. Um, things started picking up for me. I started working with Julie Christmas on her solo record and started working on other things. So it just never happened. And then I think Greg sort of just bowed out, like, you know, politely was like, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm good, dude. You know, and then uh, he went on to do whatever, you know, his, his, you know, he had, of course, an incredible run with Dillinger and then the Black Queen and all of the stuff he did. And then throughout all those years, we just never got to put out the rest of this music, which was why I released in 2000, I think it was 2015, I put out the Parallels album, mm -hmm. but I did all the vocals myself um, because whatever vocals he had recorded, I couldn't use at that point. Right, and at right. that point, I didn't want to use them because, you know, Greg wasn't a part of the project anymore. He had walked away from it. And um, I didn't want to, you know, keep pushing. That's yeah, a little weird. You know, yeah. yeah. So I wound up recording vocals um, myself and, and having a, a friend of mine, Sabrina Ellie, recorded some vocals. Julie Christmas put, uh, did vocals for two songs. And we wound up with a, with a record. And, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of it. it was, I'm really glad I did that because it kind of put a period at the end of that sentence for me. It was like, all right, now I can kind of work on other stuff. Now you and then I continued on. to put out Spilocopa records with just really by myself. And, um, and now it's La Macchia. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm excited for you, man. I think, like I said, if the, the single that's out now is any indication, I'm really stoked for the record and I'm hoping that you come out to the West coast. That was um, the plan. So hopefully I can catch that. And, you know, for people that are watching this with hopes of like news of Candiria reunions and whatnot, like you heard the man, there's a uh, families are, are happening, which is what happens at this age group. You know, sure. I, yeah. that's where that's where my band situation kind of took a dive too, because everybody started having kids and mm -hmm. moving to different areas for job opportunities. And it's, you know, because yeah. it, it's not easy to be in a band. It's not as luxurious as it seems. You know? No. People don't not. make money, so no, you don't. You gotta go make a living somewhere, and um, that happens. But yeah. you know, never, like you said, never say never. Uh, you see these right. reunion shows happening now at like Furnace Fest, and mm -hmm. you know these bands coming back together. So I'm pretty sure I'll get a chance. As I never got to see Kendaria live, so I'm, I'm I feel confident in knowing that maybe in a few years that'll be a thing. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, man. You never know. I mean. If there's one thing that um, we can always count on is the fact that when we do get together, it's so much fun and we have a blast and it's like old times and we're like kids, you know, we're like these young guys all over again. And it's just nothing but jokes and, and, and laughing and, and playing fun music that's full of energy. Um, so um, it's possible, man. You never know. Yeah, it's not. There's no beef, which is good because that's that's oh, the no. case with a lot of these reunions. That you know, somebody yeah. starts hating each other, and then they have to like, well, there's a lot of money on the line, so let's just mm -hmm. tolerate each other to get this right. reunion. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. So, but that's a, that's exciting, man. I'm mean, I'm happy for you, and you know, you like you got so much going on. Like you said, you were working. You know, you're directing videos. The the album, the vinyl for uh, the the new solo, it, it has a hundred page art book. Did you do all the art? Um, well, most of it, yeah. It's it's filled with um, um, drawings, um, some of my photography, a lot of my photography actually. Um, sort of like some, you know, some. Uh, I don't know. It's it's a, a lot of it is that, um, and then it's like some text, some writings. There's uh, obviously lyrics, and it's it's def it's like a companion piece to the album. And the cool thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put in like QR codes that can take you to like different like you know, uh, landing pages 
that will offer, you know, additional music and it'll offer like access to this and that and like all kinds of weird fun shit. Um, so it's something I've never done before and it's something that Aqualam has been doing for a long time now. And it seems to me that like a lot of other record labels, like I noticed like Sargent House is putting out books now and they're kind of like, I think Aqualam was kind of like at the front line of this kind of putting out like books for every album. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, a lot, it seems a lot of labels are kind of following suit because it's a kind of an uncharted sort of, sort of uncharted, at least in recent history. And um, it's a very cool way to, to kind of be, like put out music and have people experience it. Because if you have the, if it's, it's, it's all it is is a digital download, then why not offer something more, um, you know, something more like something more uh, substantial than just like a CD with a booklet. Why not offer right. more something more visually or something more with the way you can be so creative with like the use of like QR codes that access the web. It's like you're getting this whole other experience that is really, really cool. Have you considered, you know, since you do so much photography and art and, and whatnot, do you have you considered doing a show like a gallery show? Well, that actually is something that we're going to plan to do as well. A mm -hmm. little bit later in the year, I want to do an exhibit that's like a full on um, pretty much an exhibit that uh, showcases all of the art, all of the video, all of the music in one place in this, in this, you know, th that this album, like, you know, that all of, all the things that, that exist within this world that has been created. Um, and that's something that I plan on doing in the fall, um, simply because there's so much that is still happening. We haven't, <laughs> there's just a lot that's happening and uh, we have to get some shows under our belt before I go ahead and start working on an exhibit. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. it's something that I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm determined to make it happen, and uh, we have some really cool stuff planned. Um, so I'm glad you asked because yeah, the answer is definitely yes. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah. Uh, is there also like for for your live shows? I mean, obviously budget is a thing, but mm -hmm. uh, is it more? Is it your vision to kind of have this kind of visual? production with the live shows that, that mm -hmm. can kind of present all of it together you know lots of projectors and lights and mm -hmm. whatnot that is the goal right now it's just getting up on stage and rocking the hell out because <laughs> we are the opening act mostly um mm -hmm. actually this show we're playing we are main support but um we haven't had the opportunity i haven't had the opportunity to do something that is really like grandiose or over the top but that is definitely the plan the plan is to definitely incorporate all different types of um, media and visual aspects and kind of like performance art. I want to do something really, really fun. And um, even the videos that we're making, we're really, we're just trying to be as creative as humanly possible and, and um, not for the sake of being creative, but because, you know, Aqualam, these, are, these, these guys come from design. They come from, they're both musicians. They're both from the art world. They come, they come from this, this design world. Um, and, um, it just makes sense to do stuff that is substantial and not just like, you know, a lyric video, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but we want to, um, we want to dig into some, some really, in, you know, some really, um, intense like animation and like, we're working with like really cool directors and people that really know their shit. And, uh, so, uh, it's been a fun ride and it's just going to get wilder as we go. Hell yeah, man. Hell, mm -hmm. that's a great way to, to end it here. So um, for everybody that's watching and listening, Thunderheads comes out May 20th. That's when the digital album comes out. The record will be out June 1st. Uh, right. where, where can people pre-order it and, and start following and, and getting on board with this? Um, they can go to aqualam.org. Um, aqua, lamb, one word. Mm -hmm. um, Dot org and uh, the album is up there for pre-sale on vinyl and two limited edition colors. Um, you can pick up the book there. You can pick up the book and the vinyl or the CD in the book. There's all kinds of combinations of ways you can pick it up. Um, and yeah, I would go there. I would go aqualam.org. Um, follow me on La at Lamakia Music pretty much across all social media, but mainly Instagram and Facebook these days. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also on TikTok. I'm starting, oh. you know, I'm you're trying. Doing dances? You're doing dancing? What's going on? <laughs> I have my band members doing dance steps. I oh, just feel okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. That's the key. That's the key. Yeah, don't, Keep don't, 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 yeah. <laughs>
um, yeah, and you know, I gotta say, I gotta point this out, and maybe because I'm petty and and frugal, but it the album is affordable compared to what some uh, what I've seen. You know, like I, the prices of vinyl has been skyrocketing for oh, me. It's crazy, like, man. It's crazy. You know, I want I wanted to buy the new Meshuga album, and I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll wait till they come on tour, and I'll buy it from right. them direct because right. it's like forty, fifty, sixty dollars. Oh my god! Well, no, this is this is 20. more reasonable. Yeah, twenty bucks, man. We, you know, look, I'm, I, I own a label for 15 years. I have records that are on sale on my site for $12, $15. I know what it costs to make the record. I get there's some crazy shit happening in the world right now with vinyl. And um, I get that it's a difficult time for musicians in general to kind of sort of um, make up for the fact that they haven't been on the road and this and that. But I also think charging an exorbitant amount of money for something that I know costs what it costs, you yeah. know, I think is a little, it's kind of look. I mean, look, if you want it that bad, you're going to spend the money, you know? Sure. But I also think at the same time, it's like, mm, I don't know. It's not a cool, it's not a good look in my opinion. I yeah. think, you know, keep it affordable. Um, but I'm, you know, once again, I'm, I'm me, my sugar is my sugar that they'll sell yeah. out, but whatever the hell they charge for their vinyl, they will sell it. Um, yeah. And, and that's not to say that they don't have a good reason why they're doing it. Who knows? But sure. I get what you're saying, Eddie. It's fucking it's, insane. It's, it's insane. It's crazy. Look, I collect records and I support bands and I love Meshuga, But mm -hmm. look, it's it stopped me from pre-ordering it. Sure. Like, and me, I'm, I, I was like, you know what? They're coming. I have tickets to when they come to L.A. I'll just buy mm -hmm. it from the merch booth. You sure. know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a uh, it's kind of a deterrent. And, right. and I, I, yeah. if you have your reasons, you have your reasons. And that's fine. But mm -hmm. good Lord. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. I, I think what they're banking on is the fact that there are enough people out there that have that have an expendable income to that will spend the money just because they know that they can resell it on Discogs. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like that's another thing. Like a lot of people are buying and just reselling and charging mm -hmm. a lot because vinyl pressings are selling out. I mean, there are, it's crazy what's happening with vinyl right now, man. Like the you know, 10 years ago, you could press the record and it was like, yeah, whatever, man, just put it out. Eventually it'll sell. You put out a record now and you have any kind of name, it's going to move. It's going to mm -hmm. move. You know what I mean? So, uh, and when it does and it sells out, people that buy this stuff and resell it, that's a, that's all, that's what they want to do, man. They just want to keep it moving. And, it, and it's everywhere. That, that reseller culture is in every mm -hmm. aspect. It's in beer it's in records it's in shirts and sneakers like i just don't yep. i don't get it and i hate it right. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like i wanted i got into turnstile uh with their newest album glow on and i was mm. like oh you know what this just, album's great i'm gonna go buy the vinyl i'm like oh it's sold out and i look up online it's a thousand dollars i'm like no oh my god there's That's no insane. way there's no bands that good <laughs> <laughs> it's a thousand dollars to buy a vinyl fucking record it's insane yeah. that is insane yeah. Yeah, man. Wow. But anyway, but anyway, I appreciate the pricing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I appreciate you coming on the show and, and spending some time with me, man. And hopefully, like I said, we can catch you here in the West Coast and we can high five and and uh, hug our broken, accident prone bodies uh, <laughs> at one sure. point. I'd love to yeah. do that, man. I'm actually yeah. going to be out in L.A. Um, oh. in May, in, in mid-May, but I'm going out there for like social reasons. I'm going to a wedding. Oh, so cool. I'm going to be around. So maybe I will see you if I'm yeah, not. Yeah. I have a wedding and then I, the day before I have some stuff to do and then I have a day off. So maybe we will be able to meet up. Yeah. Hit me up. I'm, I have a, I'm running a show out of the comedy store in Hollywood now too. So I can take oh. you there if you want to watch a show or something. So sure. it should be a good time. Cool, man. Let's stay in touch. Let's try to do it. All right, man. Well, cheers, everybody. Make sure you pick up the album or go at least at the very least, go watch the video for the new song that's available now on YouTube. Uh, and thanks again, dude. Eddie, thank you so much, man. I appreciate Cheers. it. Cheers. All right, man.